Hey everyone and welcome back to this class. In this lecture, I want to answer the question, when should I use a support vector machine? In my free NumPy course, I talk about using different machine learning models on data, and I gave you a brief overview of when to use each type of model. In this lecture, I want to go more in depth about one model in particular, the support vector machine. The first thing I want to talk about is what makes the support vector machine a good model to use. There are two reasons I want to discuss. The first reason is in the context of linear classification. As you know, in linear classification, our job is to separate the colors using a line. In this example, you can see that there are multiple lines that can do the job. Are they all the same? The answer is no. In this example, it's easy to see that the line in the middle is likely the best line. There's no reason for this line to be off to one side or another, and there's no reason for this line to be rotated. Imagine if I pick this bad rotated line. Now let me add a new data point. You can see that this new data point pretty clearly belongs on the blue side. If you had to make a prediction for this new data point, your intuition tells you that it should probably be classified as blue. Yet this line makes the wrong prediction. So one reason that the SVM is a good classifier is because it actually tries to find this line in the middle. Other linear classifiers, such as the perceptron, might not. The second reason that the SVM is a very good classifier is that it very easily transforms into a nonlinear classifier. As you might imagine, most real-world datasets have nonlinear decision boundaries. Lines are a good first approximation, but are rarely the final answer. Now, it's not my goal in this lecture to go into any mathematical detail, but rather just mention the main points. In my SVM course, I go very in-depth into all these details, so if that's what you're looking for, then you know where to go. The first point is that SVMs are able to find nonlinear decision boundaries by employing a technique known as the kernel trick. The kernel trick is synonymous with SVMs, but once you learn it, you'll see how it can be applied to other kinds of models as well. Some examples are kernel linear regression for regression, kernel logistic regression for classification, kernel k-means clustering for clustering, and kernel PCA for dimensionality reduction and data visualization. In my deep learning course, we do a visual example of neural network regression. And one thing that's clear is that the neural network has some trouble predicting the values at the outer edges of this function. You can see that kernel linear regression does not have this problem. It's interesting to compare it to another popular model, the random forest. It turns out to do even worse on this problem. Even the popular tree ensemble, XGBoost, doesn't perform well. So those are two good reasons to use the SVM. First, the SVM doesn't just find some decision boundary, it finds the best decision boundary. And second, the SVM can automatically be converted into a nonlinear kernel machine that yields nonlinear decision boundaries which fits complex real-world data. A couple other good reasons to use SVMs are as follows. As you might recall, one problem with some other machine learning algorithms is that they can get trapped in local optima. The SVM problem has only one global optimum. Another benefit of the SVM is that there are not too many hyperparameters to choose. If you've ever used deep learning, then you know how cumbersome it can be. You have to choose the learning rate, the type of gradient descent algorithm to use, the momentum parameter, the batch size, the number of hidden layers, the number of hidden units, the activation function, and so forth. As you recall, these hyperparameter choices suffer from what is called the curse of dimensionality. If you only have two hyperparameters, then your search space is a square, but if you have three, then your search space is a cube, and so forth. In other words, your search space grows geometrically. Luckily, the SVM only really has two simple hyperparameters to balance, and they are very intuitive to reason about. 
when you're using the SVM, you have a choice about which kernel to use, but most often the Gaussian kernel is a fine default choice. Thus, even if it appears you might have more options, we already have some widely agreed upon rules of thumb. Another benefit of the SVM is that the same techniques can be used for both classification and regression problems. It's a great plug and play or off the shelf model for many supervised machine learning tasks. In other words, if you have a machine learning problem, then without even doing much tinkering, you can just plug in an SVM and expect pretty decent performance. Since scikit-learn includes other machine learning models in addition to the SVM, that makes them all equally easy to use. But the SVM is more powerful than most of them. For example, naive Bayes, decision trees, logistic regression, linear regression, and k-nearest neighbor, the SVM beats them all. Of course, there are some downsides to the SVM as well, but these actually help us. They help us understand when the SVM should be used and when it should not be used. So let's look at some of these limitations. The first and most glaring disadvantage of SVMs is that they won't scale to large datasets. Training a kernel machine such as the SVM requires you to calculate a kernel matrix, which is an n by n matrix where n is the number of samples in your dataset. That means any algorithm which requires the kernel trick is at least O of n squared. That means you can have algorithms which are O of n cubed or even worse. The other limitations of the SVM aren't necessarily limitations of the model per se, but just instances where another model may be more appropriate. The first scenario is when you have tabular data. As I always say, all data is the same. This means that for a typical supervised machine learning task, you have an input data matrix X of shape n by d and a target vector Y of shape n by 1. SVMs are of course designed exactly for this type of data, but as we discussed, it won't scale if n is large. One possible workaround for when we have large data sets is to make our algorithm parallelizable. In fact, the SVM actually is parallelizable and some research has been done at Google on this problem. The problem is it's not very well known, so you won't find an implementation of it in popular distributed computing libraries. However, there is an algorithm which is more naturally parallelizable, and that's tree ensembling. Some examples of tree ensembles are random forests, AdaBoost, and gradient boosted trees. Now, because these algorithms are naturally distributed, you can find them in libraries such as MLlib, which runs on Spark, a distributed computing platform. So you get the benefit of very accurate models which run on distributed clusters without really doing any additional work. The second scenario is when you have unstructured, or as I like to call it, natural data. This is data which isn't necessarily not tabular, but it's data that comes from nature. Often they are real valued signals. Some examples are images and speech. So if you're doing image classification or speech recognition, that's the type of data you would have. Images are just light intensity as a function of space in two dimensions. Sound is just air pressure as a function of time. Language, as in sentences and words, are also natural signals, but they are not real valued. For natural data such as speech, sound, images, and so forth, Deep learning is currently the winner. Deep learning lets you build a hierarchical structure of the data. So if your neural network learned about images of faces, you would find that each subsequent layer learns to recognize increasingly complex features, from basic strokes to different parts of the face to full faces. This is in contrast to SVMs, which are shallow models. In addition, training deep neural networks is only O of N, although many passes through the training data have to be done. Luckily, there's been a lot of work done to make training deep neural networks faster, such as creating new hardware like GPUs and TPUs. To summarize, here is when you should use the SVM. If you're looking for a quick and dirty plug-and-play supervised model, if you need a powerful nonlinear function approximator, 
If you need a principled way of finding a decision boundary, for example, in the maximum margin sense, if you are doing binary classification, you can learn more about this in my SVM course, but long story short, the SVM was invented with binary classification in mind. If n, the number of samples in your training set, is about 10 to the 5 or less. If your data is sparse, for example, you're using TF-IDF and most of the entries in your data matrix are zero. Here's when you should not use the SVM. If your data set is large, in this case, you might want to use something parallelizable like a tree ensemble. And if you're working with natural data, such as images, sound, or text, in this case, deep learning is the state of the art. This is, incidentally, another case where your data set is too large. So pretty much just don't use SVM when your data set is too large. Otherwise, the SVM is a handy and powerful tool which is extremely simple to use.